Hello, this is David welcoming you to another D&D History Hub podcast. Uh, before I continue, could I ask you please to give us a thumbs up if you enjoy this episode and to consider subscribing to our channel. It really helps a lot. Now, back in 2019, the writer and commentator Douglas Murray published a book titled The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity. It was an analysis of the uh, modern culture wars and a takedown of the rising woke phenomenon. Now, I don't know if all this culture wars woke stuff amounts to madness, I suppose it's a matter of opinion, depending on where you sit on the ideological fence. But it seems clear that Douglas Murray thinks it's nuts, because the first part of his title, The Madness of Crowds, is lifted from a much older book whose subject matter was not very much short of stark raving bonkers. And this was the Scottish journalist Charles McKay's 1841 publication titled Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And that's the book there. That's my copy of the book there at any rate. Now, it describes numerous historical human follies, as he calls them, such as the crazes for things like alchemy, magnetism as a cure-all medicine, various balmy get-rich-quick schemes, such as the insane investment in tulips in 17th century Holland, mass poisonings in the name of medicine, the profound belief in fortune-telling, and the enormous popularity of so-called seers, such as Nostradamus, and an extremely popular tourism trade centred on visiting haunted houses. McKay observed that people seem to get swept up in what he calls moral epidemics. He says, people think in herds and go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. The British historian Norman Stone, writing in 1995, said that McKay's book is as relevant today as it was more than a hundred years ago, because folly changes only in detail and not in scale. Perhaps he's right. In any case, it seems um, Douglas Murray would agree with that sentiment. I'm not going to try to cover all of the crazy stuff in the um, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds book. Instead, I'm just going to fairly briefly focus on one that, while it's a terribly, horribly tragic, it nevertheless displays all the symptoms of the most deranged kind of crowd behaviour. It's the witch hunt mania that began to take shape in Europe early in the 15th century, peaking in the 16th century, and slowly declining through the 17th century and into the 18th and 19th centuries. For hundreds of years, the word witch was on everybody's tongues, writes Mackay. England, Scotland, France and Germany went mad on the subject, and for many years held so many witchcraft trials that real crimes went unnoticed. Thousands upon thousands of women fell victim to this cruel and absurd delusion, he says. In Germany, for example, more than 600 people a year, two every day, were executed for this pretended crime. The malevolent force behind witchcraft, the one who supposedly gave it power, was the devil, to whom it was said the witch renounced baptism and sold her immortal soul. McKay is no apologist at all for the witch hunters, but he does attempt to contextualise it within the 
available knowledge at the time. After all, in any era, including ours, we don't know what we don't know. Humans feel, he says, that they have within them a spirit which shall never die. And all our experience of this life makes us cling to this hope. But in the early days of little knowledge, this grand belief became the source of a whole train of superstitions from which flowed a deluge of blood and horror. For more than 250 years, Europe brooded on the idea that not only parted spirits walk the earth to meddle in human affairs, but that humans had the power to summon evil spirits to their aid and to work woe upon their fellows. It was genuinely thought that the earth swarmed with millions of demons of both sexes, which increased and multiplied. Evil spirits are so numerous they couldn't be counted. Furthermore, these spirits could and did spread pain, diseases and terrible dreams. The case says an epidemic of terror took hold of entire societies and nobody thought themselves secure from the machinations of the devil and his agents. Every Calamity that befell them, they attributed to a witch. If a storm wrecked their barn, if their cattle got sick, if a beloved relative died, or if they themselves got sick, well, it wasn't simply bad luck, but the works of some neighbouring hag whose wretchedness or insanity caused the ignorant to raise their finger and point it at her as a witch. Now, the witch hunt mania really kicked off from 1485 under Pope Innocent, nicely known, who was sincerely alarmed at the number of witches supposedly practicing their maleficent arts. And so in 1488, he called on the nations of Europe to rescue the church from the perils and horrors of Satan. The devil said the Pope, who encouraged both men and women to have sex with infernal fiends which caused numerous stillbirths and destroyed crops, fruit trees and cattle. These fiends were witches. And so the Pope appointed inquisitors in every country who made it their sole business to find and eliminate the witches. Under torture, these poor women confessed to such things as midnight rendezvous with the devil, attending witches' Sabbath, raising whirlwinds and calling down lightning, and having sex at midnight with Satan. Found guilty, they would be burned alive. And so it went, year after year, for years on end. The fires for the execution of witches blazing in almost every town in Europe. But just to show us they were an equal opportunity inquisition, a number of male wizards were also executed for such things as attending Saturnalian orgies with fiends and preparing infernal unguents for the blighting of cattle and crops. Now McKay notes also that the Protestants were just as eager to hunt witches as Catholics, with both uh, uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin zealously encouraging the persecution of witches. The witch mania was all throughout Europe, but it held uh, a, its grip in Scotland and England. Uh, at this time, and in 1562, Queen Elizabeth recognised witchcraft as a crime of the highest magnitude, although, in fact, many women were executed without so much as a show trial. So, by the mid-1600s, England had its own chief witch-finder general, 
a certain Matthew Hopkins, a man who had the uncanny ability to discover the marks of the devil on numerous women, whom the Witchfinder General then had burnt at the stake across the country. The Witchfinder General travelled from town to town, always residing at the very best inn and charging 20 shillings a pop for his witch-finding services. And so it went, year after year, hundreds and hundreds of unfortunate women suffering the most terrible persecution and ghastly execution. The mania slowly faded, although McKay notes that even in the mid-1800s, at the time of his writing this book, the superstition that witches are real still lingered, he says, to an almost inconceivable extent, although nobody at that time was getting burned alive for it. The history of the witch hunts and the fiery executions is truly terrible. Awful. But the thing is, people believe that witchcraft was real. They believed in the tangible existence of demons and devils and black magic. The trouble with a delusion in any era, ours included, is that you don't know when you are deluded. That's something to think about. So thank you for listening and goodbye.